Welcome everybody to the Choose to Think podcast. I am so glad that you're here and I have an amazing guest for you today. Her name is Melanie Penn and you may recognize that name. She is a songwriter and a singer, if I have that right, Melanie, but welcome to the show. I'm going to read your bio in just a second. So let me tell you. Yes, let me tell you about Melanie. She's a singer-songwriter best known for her original album, Emmanuel, which is a retelling of the Christmas story. For many years, she was a mainstay of the New York theater scene and played Sandy on the national tour of Greece with Frankie Avalon. Okay, that's cool. And then she recently released her fifth album, More Alive, Volume 1, and is getting to release Volume 2. Currently, um, let's see, you, you may go by Mel, I guess, divides her time between New York City and Nashville. So, oh my goodness, I'm going to come right out of the gate by reading one of your, the lyrics to one of your songs, because I knew it would resonate with my listeners. In this day and age, Worry and anxiety is at an all-time high. I think everyone would agree with that. Thank goodness we're kind of coming into the spring months and there's more sunshine and longer days, at least where I live in Kentucky. And so that has a way of really lifting the moods a little bit, just the sunshine alone and all that good vitamin D we can get. But I've even personally in my life, Melanie, recently realized that I have a little bit of a, of a root of fear or anxiety or worry that I never knew I really had. And I'm transitioning to a, a new relationship in my life and things are changing with my family dynamics. I just, you know, all my kids are now, I have four kids and they're all out of the home now, but, and I'm in now in a relationship to be married. And so things are so exciting and so wonderful, but I found myself recently being a little more anxious than normal, than quote normal, about my future. And I'm like, what the heck? What is going on with you, Victoria? Why? You're, you're in the choose to think business. You need to start monitoring your thoughts. But then it occurred to me that sometimes when we are in transition, even, we or when things are changing or when we're growing or we're developing or we're in new seasons of our lives, we have everything's new and novel and maybe we have to deal with past issues in a different way maybe we have to you know as we're asking god to help us with our future we have to partner with him on that and there are there seem to be more unknowns i mean there's so many issues it doesn't have to be that we're necessarily worrying about covid the pandemic the war you know with russia and the ukraine all of those big 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 things that can kind of weigh us down but it, it could be just simple things even in our lives that that cause us to gravitate toward worry and anxiety and maybe even in new ways as in my case and so i thought if i could just read these lyrics and then we could talk about that and i want to know how, how you personally deal with worry and anxiety and i know a lot of it is putting our eyes on jesus and casting our cares that way but how do we do that in the here and now and in the practical way? So are you good with that if I read your lyrics? That sounds great. <laughs> okay. All right. Let me get to that screen. So the song that, um, did you write the song, Melanie? The Don't Worry song? Yes, okay. All right. Good. So they go like this and the song is called Don't Worry. And you can find it on, I, I mean, I'm just, I just Googled it, but you're on YouTube and we'll talk about connecting with you a little bit later and how folks can get in touch with you and how they can actually hear this song. I'll put a link in the, in the show notes directly to this song, but this is what Melanie wrote. And I'm going to say that you wrote this maybe in 2019 or that's when the song came out. Do I have that right? Yeah, I think it came out in 2019. I don't remember exactly when we finished recording it maybe earlier that year. Okay. And so interesting yeah. because this was before COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Timely. Okay. So this is what she, she wrote. It says this, I lie awake sometimes about a million regrets, all I've done and all I've left undone. My only peace of mind is that it's incomplete. Your work in me is only begun. Oh, I believe it, even when I can't see it. 
You are always watching over me. Oh, I believe it even when I don't feel it. You are watching over everything. Don't worry, it'll be all right. Every bird on a wing or any flower that grows is never anxious for a single thing. My confidence is in the only one who can know how to give me everything I need. Don't worry, it'll be all right. And then the repeat here, oh, I believe it even when I can't see it. You are always watching over me. Oh, I believe it even when I don't feel it. You are watching over everything. That is beautiful. I hear reflections of scripture there, and I see how you've capitalized. My confidence is in the only one talking about God. But could you just tell us a little bit about why it is you even wrote that song? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, thank you for that question. I, you know, overall, I enjoy, you know, it sounds very much um, that our ministries are similar. Like I really enjoy putting things into the world that are comforting to people. Yes. And I inten very intentionally do that, especially in um, a pop culture that seems to put things out into the world that are like very dark. Like even our entertainment has a very dark undertone. There's this whole like anti-hero movement in our culture like all our tv shows are about like the dark hero who's like you know fatally flawed and never really overcomes those flaws like the don draper types that's just just like it's a little bit of a tangent but just an example of like how dark our culture cultural expressions have become so when i write songs i try to be a counter to that and a really simple song like don't worry is a perfect example and i wrote the song with um my producer in nashville i wrote all the lyrics and he kind of wrote a beat underneath it and i just wanted the melody to be very calming it's not a real rangy melody it has a lot of like single notes in a row like it doesn't have major melodic leaps or anything. It's just very like physiologically calm. <laughs> and that's what I wanted to do. I have other songs that are like full of lyrics and full of like my voice, you know, jumping around and being more flashy or whatever. And this song isn't that. And I love that about it. And, you know, of any song, Don't Worry has kind of gotten out of the States kind of beyond my normal reach. I had to call United Airlines like before COVID and I got some girl from the Philippines on the phone at United and I was trying to change a flight and she was like, are you Melanie Penn? Do you sing Don't Worry? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's me. And she was some like 18 year old in the Philippines who had like gotten the song and now we're friends on Instagram and everything. But it's just like who, who cannot be attracted to that message? Did that message come from a personal event or was that, was there something on your heart at the moment? Or did you just in all your relationships, your friendships, your industry, did you just realize like pop culture, as you mentioned, but did you think, wow, there's a real need here for this because folks are really edgy, anxious, or they are worrying? How, how did you, how were you inspired to write this song? Victoria, I wish I had a fancy answer for you. My my producer texted me the beat and he he said he texted me the beat in a little sound file and he said, I just had an artist uh decline to use to use this beat. Can you write something for it? And I because he had another artist in Nashville that he had written it for. And I was walking through Brooklyn and I put on my little earbuds and listened to it and like, boom, don't worry, came out. There was like no forethought. I was just like, oh, I believe it. <laughs> Even when I don't feel it. I mean, it was just kind of popped, popped up. That's so some, amazing. Yeah, but I mean, you're right that the song does have scripture in it. And when lyrics have scripture in them. I think that it's not really like I wrote anything new. I just kind of accessed the eternal word that is always there. We know Christ's words are eternal. So they are kind of always there to kind of grab <laughs> or like fall onto you. And sometimes it's a song. 
Right. And I love that particular line that you just sang because, you know, it's, oh, I believe it even when I don't feel it. Nowadays, we focus a lot on our feelings and we allow our feelings to dictate, in some cases, the course of our behavior and the actions we take. And in, instead, we, you know, I like to teach, I do, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching and group coaching, and we teach instead that, okay, we're going to kind of analyze our feelings and our emotions because they are God-given and they are great signposts and indicators on kind of what's churning inside our heart, what's good, what's not so good. They're just indicators for us. But if we get stuck in feeling certain feelings or emotions, they, that can really lead us to a dark place or even a dead end street. And so we kind of take back our emotions in the sense of we're not going to let our feelings run the show, really. And so when we're talking about, look, I'm, I'm just not going to worry because I'm going to trust God in my life and in this scenario then no matter if I feel a little bit anxious or I feel a little bit unsure or tentative or doubtful or worrisome, whatever that feeling might be, we're still going to back up knowing that God is God and he's not changing. And that's something that's trustworthy and he is worth believing in. And so I love that line because it, it kind of keeps feelings in perspective there. And I don't know also, Melanie, if, you know, I mean, how curious it is that you're just walking in Brooklyn. That sounds like so neat to just be walking around, put your, you know, listening to this and, and just energized in the gifting and how God has gifted you and to just allow that to be birthed and to rise up in you. And I wonder if, you know, now someone in the Philippines even has heard that song. Do you get much like feedback or do you get other feedback about the song or how that particular song has resonated with other people? Yeah, I, I mean, I, a little bit on social media and um, there's a video on YouTube we made. And so people comment on the video, but you know, it's not like I'm not super famous or anything. So it's not like I get flooded with feedback all the time. But that's okay. I know that it's a great song. And the, the nice thing about songs is they are always there. And so someone might be finding me now through another song and then they kind of like backtrack and see what else is out there and they can discover a song that's like three years old now. And that's the great thing about having kind of like being a little bit older where I have like a work, you know, the work accumulates over the years and people can find it. Right. And they, once they get in there and then they can look at your song titles and there is that theme, as you mentioned a moment ago, of offering comfort and encouragement and inspiration to others. And it's so refreshing. They're, you know, they resonate with the listeners, but also you kind of like, oh, that's such a good song. Oh, that, that's right. I forgot that in the moment, but I'm going to shift my focus now and, and move on to something else and to where I can find that freedom and that, uh, that kind of, you know, burdens are lifted in a way when we shift our perspective back to some of what your lyrics are, are actually promoting. So good for you. And I think you are famous. I mean, I look at your, at your channel and your, your listenership and, you know, you're impacting the kingdom and you're working hard to do that. And I'm sure it's not really easy. I do want to know what is your favorite song or could you even pick one out of all the songs that you've done written or sung? Do you have a favorite? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I, I do love the whole Emmanuel project mm. and always direct people to that. And um, I, I, I don't know. I'm trying to think of, do I have a favorite song in the Emmanuel project? I, I just love them all. They're like my children. I love them equally, but um, there's something about that project that is like very sweet. It was very unexpected. I never, certainly never sought to make an album about the nativity or any of the um, people and the Christmas story. And that project kind of tumbled out over the course of a year. And it, you know, not only had a, a lasting impact on my career, but it, I've 
feel as though, you know, talk about feelings. I, I just think that project will really outlive me and kind of go on to bless people. And I just, I think it's truly great. And I can't really take any responsibility for it. Like, I'm just so aware that that project was a gift from the Lord and he like trusted me with stewarding it. And, you know, that's, that's really sweet. That's, Emmanuel. Yeah. Yeah. That is so sweet. And, you know, I kind of came into this interview, like all systems go and we went right into this song. And so I want to backtrack just a teeny bit and tell us about you and where you grew up and how did you get into singing? What's the story on that? I interviewed Jenny Owens last year and read her book, Singing in the Darkness, and such a wonderful tribute of just, you know, it was her whole life, basically, and spiritual applications, biblical applications that she kind of just wove throughout that, that work. And she, of course, is a singer songwriter as well. But can you share, you know, from the very beginning to where you on are now, just a little bit about yourself? I, I would love to know that. Sure, sure, sure. Um, very, very short version. I Grew up in the suburbs of D.C. in Falls Church, Virginia. I always sang. I went to college um, to study music, to study vocal performance, which was like an opera track. And it became very clear in my college years that I didn't have a voice that was going to be some operatic, you know, phenom. It just wasn't going to happen. Um, and so I thought, OK, well, I'll go to New York and pursue musical theater instead, because it's just not as vocally, it's very it's very trying to be on Broadway, but it's not as vocally taxing as opera is. And so I was like, okay, I'll, do, I'll go do that. And somewhere, somewhere in that mix, I thought, I just started to want to write songs. So I started writing songs pretty late in my life. I think I was like 28 or 29. And I had been in musical theater in New York for a number of years and I just started to want to sing my own songs. I thought, okay, I do eight shows a week and I say all the words that are written on the page and I sing the same songs every night. And is it possible that I could sing my own words? And that I just followed that desire down the path to try and write songs. And now that's what I do. <laughs> and it was like, so I've taken a couple of detours as a vocalist but I really am so happy where I am now. And I, yeah, I, I, I think if I could tell anyone who was curious about kind of striking out on their own or writing in any way that it is not something to be intimidated by, it's like available. And, you know, you talk about overcoming fears and anxieties. I think that the enemy puts in us these lies that are like, oh, I could never, I could never write my own songs. Like I'm just not good enough, or I'm not like blessed in that way, or I could never do this. I could never do that. And it's a way that the enemy actually like silences the work. Like if the enemy can convince you that you're not able and you don't try, then nothing, then that's like the greatest strategy, right? Like what would an, what would a very adept enemy do? Like go to the source, like cut you off at the source. And so anyway, that's it. I, I have a little bit of a unique songwriting story because I started writing songs as an adult. But I was always a singer. I had that going for me. You know, I knew how to kind of, you know, use my voice in a way that was good. Mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs> did, did you ever face certain lies of the enemy did you ever recognize them along the way for in, in your own life that you had to say, Ooh, I'm just not going to listen to that. Or I'm going to resist the enemy attack there. Was it ever something really deeply personal for you as you've journeyed forth? And, and the reason I'm asking this is kind of what you said. And it, it may be that a listener says, you know, I always wanted to to bake cookies and I love baking cookies and all my family loves my cookies and 
I would love to have a little shop, a pastry shop. And, but then there's something that plays interference. There's some little thought that's engaged, maybe something that's God limiting. I, sometimes I said you hear self-limiting thoughts, but I, I think sometimes a better way to say that is God limiting thoughts. Like, I, am I believing thoughts that are limiting God in some way? And, but at any rate is, you know, there may be some dream that some listener has. We all have dreams and aspirations and maybe we put them on hold because we've raised a family. Maybe we've put them on hold because we're always doing something else, serving somewhere else. Maybe it was a financial issue, a gazillion reasons that we could put dreams on hold. But many of my listeners are kind of close to my age coming after the kids are, are gone. And, and now we're, we're looking at kind of chapter two and what are we going to do and so sometimes there's something that needs to be resurrected there or some little thing that's that we're thinking oh I want to go do this I want to start writing I want to publish a book I want to open my own jewelry shop and it could be so many different things those dreams and for you Melanie you were gifted you said I've always I've always been singing and so God gifted with you, gifted you with such a beautiful, beautiful voice, has gifted you with an ability to connect with your listeners on very meaningful uh, points in, you know, that reach their heart and connect with their heart and that encourage and comfort and impact them positively and inspire them. But you resisted, somehow you resisted the enemy along the way, and here you are walking out your dream, thankful to God as he's guided you along the path. So my question though, in all of that is, did you ever hit resistance along the way? Was there ever a point where, where you, you were afraid to keep going and you let that hold you back somehow? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Can you unpack that a little bit? Just so that if, if there's a listener who says, I, I don't think I can, I, I want to, I've always wanted to, I know I'm good at it. I have confirmation I'm good at it. I love it. I enjoy it. I lose time. I'm in the groove doing it, but I'm too afraid. So what, share your examples and maybe that would encourage our listeners too. Yeah, I'm trying to think of some practical things because I definitely struggle every day and there's lots of days where I'm like, this is folly. Like, this is total folly. You know, a lot of times I'm like, the math isn't breaking out. Like, the numbers aren't really working. It's such an investment to make an album. It's like, no one's buying CDs anymore. Blah, blah, blah. This, this, this. Like, Spotify is free. Like, all, all these things. You know, now there's shows are sort of coming back. But for two years, we haven't had live shows. And so it's like that dry. It's like, whoa. So there's always setbacks. I think there's a lot of good reasons to quit. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of good reasons to not do something. And when it comes to stepping into new territory, even if it's territory you should be in, but it feels new or it's like resurrecting, like I love that you said that. Um, someone, I, I listened to a talk one time and it talked about how when you sit on your, when you, when a limb goes to sleep, like you've been sitting on your leg or your foot, or like you've been sleeping on your arm a weird way. And, and you relieve the pressure on that limb and the blood starts flowing again. It's actually painful for a few minutes. Like it's so prickly and uncomfortable, but then once the blood is flowing again, you have use of that limb. Like so it goes from like kind of being semi-paralyzed, <laughs> circulation cut off, and then you relieve the pressure and blood is flowing again, but you can't get blood flowing again without that very achy feeling of the blood coming back. And I think that stepping into new territory is that kind of experience. And I don't, I, I have, to, I can very easily get blue and I can have very dark moods where like, like I really, I really wanted more live volume one to get onto a big label. And my producer and I shopped it everywhere. Like we pounded the pavement in Nashville. We met with everyone. Everyone said, no, I came close to a couple times. I came close to a couple labels taking it on. I had one label say, say no, but we really like you. And I wrote them back and I said, 
I'll cover your costs. Wow. Will you, will you just be part of putting this out? Like that's how desperate I was to have label power behind what I was doing. I was like, cover the cost. Like, I don't even know what I'm saying. I was just kind of like throwing, you know, I was kind of like desperate moves trying to make something happen. And it didn't. And I kind of went into a blue time after that. And you know what? I, I, but I put it out anyway, independently, and it was great. And I'm so glad that I took another step as an independent artist. I think that when those setbacks happen, if you just look at the facts, you can quit, but there's always so much more going on than the facts. Like my mom says this thing, facts don't make something true. And like an, a, a, all the labels in Nashville rejecting my last album didn't somehow make it true that the album wasn't worth putting out. Amen. So it's like as godly people, as godly people, we are, we have a supernatural responsibility to like look beyond the facts and look at the entire truth of what God is doing and be willing to accept that what we see is not all the truth there is. Like, like that's just fundamental to believing the gospel. So I think, I think that's like really important, like not just looking at the facts, like looking at what the truth is beyond the facts. And then for lies, you know, and I'm talking too much, but I, when I, when something comes in like a, a, a fiery arrow, like a dart into my mind, like I try to listen to the grammar of whatever that thought is. Mm. So, so like sometimes the grammar is this this is so stupid. This is a waste of time. So there's no personal pronouns in there. Like who's saying that? Like who's making that statement that like comes into my mind? It's probably not me, but I'm hearing it with my spiritual ears somehow. Mm. And, then, and sometimes the, the grammar is you, like it's in the second person. So it's like, you're, you're so dumb. You've, you've done the wrong thing with your life all these years. And now you're wasting more time well, why would I talk to myself like that? Like, who's talking? Who's, who's pointing the finger at me? And most likely that's the accuser saying, you're this, you're that. But then other times, and this is actually the most rare, so the, those first two categories, like listening grammatically can help you know who's speaking. And most of the time it's the accuser. And then there's, then there's a third category, which is the I, which is I. So when you have those thoughts that are I, those are actually kind of helpful because those probably say, I'm afraid. I don't have what I need. I'm tired. I'm this. Like those actually give you information because those are probably true and can guide you to fix, you know, solving whatever deficit you're revealing to yourself. You know what I mean? I do. So it's like, it's almost, it's very analytical way, but it's the only way that I have been able to really survive the onslaught of like negativity that comes and you know the bible the bible describes the devil the devil as the prince of the air right i think about that all the time so it's like and i think it's like there's like airwaves like you can get kind of hippie about it but like it's he's literally the prince of the air like his job is to send like airwaves to you to dis destabilize you immobilize you minimize you and but if you can kind of get savvy to the strategies that are there you, i think you can you know, start shrugging, shrugging things off. Like sometimes I will literally do this physically in my body and be like, get out of here. Like, just get, get away. You know, That's right. I don't know. I, I don't know what that sounds like, but the, but breaking things down grammatically has really helped me. That is powerful. And I teach a seven pronged process basically, or a method. It's like a signature strategy to live your best thought life. And what you've just described, Melanie, so wonderfully with such good examples, and thank you for that, is, is some of those first initial steps that we take. And some of it is just recognizing what we're actually thinking about and being aware of that. I love how you look at it grammatically. I'm such a grammar nerd. And I'm like, oh boy, that is so helpful. I will share that with others because it suddenly categorizes everything that we're thinking about kind of in a new way. And 
we do practice a lot of saying, you know, like who is, who's saying that to me or where is that coming from? And just even that kind of recognition is so helpful in the process of taking our thoughts captive and being transformed by renewing our mind and being on alert really. And then even resisting, you know, shrugging that off and just resisting the enemy. I call it partnering with him or coming into agreement with the enemy. Why would I want to come into agreement with the enemy of my soul? Why would I want to do that? Why do I want to play on his team? Well, of course I don't. So I have to come out of agreement with him and I have to consciously say, I'm not going to play on your team and support whatever it is you're doing or your, your attacks. I'm not going to support those. And so it's distancing ourselves from that through our awareness of it. And then that resisting or rejecting those lies and, and just, you know, shrugging them off. And so where do we go from there then? We, we then, I think, shift and we say, Lord, I'm just going to believe what you say. I want to play on your team. And, and maybe I do feel afraid. Maybe I, I am tired. Maybe I'm not really knowing what to do here or what decision to make here. But suddenly we push back to God, recognizing and confessing just how we feel. Even if we have an area of unbelief, we can confess that. Just like the gentleman who brought his son and said, Lord, can you, can you heal my son? And, and Jesus responds, can I? Like, and then, then the, the man says, the father says, oh, I'm sorry, help me with my unbelief. So we can even confess those areas of unbelief to God. He already knows them anyway, but just acknowledging them and recognizing them. And then asking for his help and depending on him. So I think in, in the backdrop of your being a social figure, a celebrity, a singer songwriter, putting your, your, yourself out there, putting your, you know, everything you're pouring yourself out for others somewhere along the line. It seems to me that you're, you've grounded yourself in knowing that God's called you to do this and you're just releasing the outcome to God and not getting caught up in analytics, the numbers, the, you know, everything that doesn't weigh up and the number of likes or who shared this or what viewer said this or commented. We have to kind of keep that in perspective. But what I hear you saying is that you're still being persistent. You're still showing up. You're saying, hey, done beats perfect. You know who for whom you work. I, I like to think of my work as my worship. And I picture myself under the yoke of Christ. And he's the real lead leader of the two. And so I'm just kind of under that yoke following him. And I see you doing all of that. I know it's not easy. And it, it we, you know, I too, I, I sometimes I can dip down if I if I'm not watching my my focus and my gaze. And if I get kind of sidetracked or if I do come into agreement with the enemy, because we're only human and sometimes we get carried away and it takes a moment or two for us to realize, whoa, I'm going down the dead end street here. But, um, but I think that any kind of, any time we put ourselves out there, even for the lady who says, I want to bake cookies, she could be saying, well, what if other people don't like them? Or what about gluten allergies? And what if, you know, I mean, just a gazillion things that that could play interference and could foster the fear and hold hold her back. But what I see in you is someone who's just so courageous. You're boldly living your faith, releasing the outcome to God. And and I can't think of a better place to be than right there doing what he's gifted you to do and enjoying that as much as you can. And then hoping and praying that it blesses someone else. You're serving and you're pouring and you're contributing to the kingdom in really marvelous ways. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Well, tell everyone, Melanie, how they can contact you and how they can reach you. Uh, yes, gladly. Um, Instagram is a great way. It's at Melanie Penn, um, P-E-N-N. -N like Penn Station. That's my last name. And I'm getting ready to announce um, 
more alive volume two. So I have a new album coming out and just hopefully a lot of like beautiful music that people will love. And I'd yeah, please join on the journey. That would be awesome. And your website is melaniepen.com. Okay, yeah. perfect. Very good. And I will put all of these links also in the show notes. Would you feel comfortable praying for us as we close? Okay, that, oh, would, be, that would be wonderful, Melanie. Lord, thank you for Victoria and her um, gener generosity, just listening to so many people and getting so many different perspectives. Um, I ask that you um, grow her ministry at the pace you see fit and like bring people to her um, YouTube channel and her podcast um, in exactly the right number. And Lord, we just pray for every, everyone who might listen to this, that they would walk away um, encouraged and that you would just show them the next step. Lord, all, all we ask for, from you is the very next step and the, the next step today. And we uh, don't seek to be greedy and ask for the whole plan or all the steps at once, just, just one at a time. And we thank you for, for doing that for us. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that one step at a time. That in itself is such an encouragement to that lady who says, yeah, I want to chase my dream. You don't have to have all the answers right now. You don't have to see down the road in two years. God will, will light your path and just just the just for the next step and as you see that light and as you commit your way to him he will certainly guide you in the path you don't go it alone so be encouraged and let's all of us together commit to fixing our eyes on Jesus and you know he fixed his eyes and and he endured the cross on our behalf and it was for a joy before him. And we can have joy in the journey as well, even though it's tricky and it's hard and it's unsure. And maybe our feet feel like they're a little unsteady. We can rest assured as Christians, as believers, that we're not alone. God is with us. He will guide us. He sends his spirit to comfort us. And if he's gifted us in the ways he's gifted us, we too can be contributors to the kingdom in ways that bless our hearts as well as the hearts of others. So together, I think we can do it. Thank you for praying that. That was just beautiful, Melanie. And thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. You bet.